John chapter 3. John chapter 3. So enjoy preaching the book of John and uh, so enjoy how supernatural preaching through the Bible is. Y'all have heard me talk a lot about expositional Bible preaching. Expositional Bible preaching. Preaching a Bible, preaching the Bible as it's written. Preaching the Bible um, for what it says. Amen. Um, you know, and I've, I've made a, the mistake of this, so you'll have to forgive me, but many times we say expositional Bible preaching means preaching verse by verse. Well, yes, if you preach verse by verse what the Bible says, because anybody can preach verse by verse and take it in an inappropriate direction and it be wrong. You know, and expositional preaching is preaching what the Bible says. <laughs> Amen? For instance, for instance, you know, I'm, I was, I, I, when I study, you all know this as well, that I will, uh, I will look up sermons. I will listen to men and hear what they've had to say about a given part of the Scripture. And, you know, here tonight we're going to look, uh, we're going to try to finish chapter 3, verse 22 through 36. And there in verse 30 is one of the most, you know, quoted, memorized verse in the Bible. It's real simple. He must increase, but I must decrease. It's John the Baptist speaking. It's a great verse. We're going to talk about it tonight. Well, I was listening to one message, and a man took that. He read a bunch of this passage, and he didn't preach not a bit of what's going on here. He didn't reference John the Baptist. He didn't reference nothing. He simply started saying some areas in our life where we need more Jesus. And that's great. We need more Jesus in every area of our life. I mean that. You know what I'm saying? Nevertheless, that's what you call uh, eisegesis of the Bible where you take something and you try to force something in it. Exegesis is where you take the Bible and you try to pull out of it what it says. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what preaching is supposed to be. Preaching should deliver to the people what the Bible says, whether that's one verse, whether that's verse by verse going through the Bible. It should always be expositional. It should always be, what's this saying? Okay? Okay. And that's my focal point tonight as we look at the Scripture, is what is going on here and how can we uh, digest it and make us stronger for Christ. Look at verse 22 with me. The Bible says, After these things came Jesus and His disciples into the land of Judea, and there He tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in uh, Aenon near Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and Jews about purification. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given from heaven. Ye yourselves bear witness, uh, bear, bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. That's a good statement, amen. That's where he's from, so that's what he is. He that is of the earth is earthly. Well, that's where he's from, and that's what he is, amen. John the Baptist is laying it out there for what he is, and he's talking about himself in a negative connotation. It's vitally important. And speak of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all, and what he hath seen and heard that he testifieth. No man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not on the Son shall not see life. 
but the wrath of God abideth on him. Amen. Strong words here uh, by John. And uh, I, you know, I don't have a real deep study here. I'm just going to kind of wade through this passage and, and draw out what's going on before us and, and try to help us to apply it best I can. You know, um, the running theme here uh, has, been, has been evident in John chapter 3. And what, what's, what's taking place is a change of guard, if you will. Um, you know, John the Baptist was before Jesus. He came before him. He was the forerunner of Christ. And I've shared with the church already how that not only was he the forerunner of Christ, but he became famous. John the Baptist was heralded. All right, not just by not just by the followers of Christ, not just by the believers in the message of uh, the gospel uh, and, and, and the receivers of the baptism of John, but even the Pharisees respected him. The Pharisees respected him. You know, Jesus uh, put, put the Pharisees <laughs> in check when, when they come at him with a question and his response was, was John the Baptist of God or not? And the Bible says that the Pharisees was like, if we say no... The people's going to kill us. They're going to attack us. But if we say yes, then we're admitting we're wrong. And what did they do? They essentially was like, we can't say. (laughs) Why? Because John the Baptist was heralded. He was respected. He he had a platform. He had a following. He had, the Bible calls, disciples. So he's a big deal. But he's just a man. He's just a man. John the Baptist is just a man. I, I, one preacher said it like this. He said, if God has called you to preach, it does not make you any more special and it does not make you any more spiritual. And to that I say amen. You know, I come from a culture and blessed beyond measure and um, have, have stood shoulder to shoulder with a bunch of peers, uh, specifically in the church I grew up in and the ministry I grew up through, that uh, also made a quote-unquote announcement that God was calling them to preach that never hit a lick at ministry. Never hit a lick. Never, never showed any sign, if you will. Showed evidence that God's calling was on their life. Never, never looked to be committed. Never looked to show that they were, quote, surrendered. And you know, I think that's a vitally important uh, detail about ministry is that you are surrendering some things. You're sacrificing some things in order to serve and be in service. And so what, what's the problem? Well, there was a, a stigma. There was, a, there was this inappropriate mindset that when I announce my call to preach, I've arrived. When I announce my, when I surrender to ministry, that means, you know, every church in the area should call me and have me come speak because I am somebody. It don't make you any more spiritual because somebody uh, surrenders to preach. It don't make them any more special because somebody announces the call to preach. John the Baptist, listen, John the Baptist was prophesied of. John the Baptist fulfilled specific prophecy surrounding the Messiah. (laughs) And you know what he said? I am nothing. I am nobody. I have nothing unless God give it to me. And that's such a wonderful truth. Amen? And so what we find here in this passage is the importance of keeping the main thing the main thing. Keeping the main person the main person. And that's Jesus Christ. Notice with me here, we find a controversial temptation. That's the title, if you will, of today's message. A controversial temptation here in the life and ministry of John the Baptist. And what we find, first of all, is a discordant uh, communication. We find some people that's attempting to sow discord. And you know that's a wicked thing. You know, the Bible specifically tells us that God hates the sowing of discord, the causing of, of problems. <laughs> How's that for a... Uh, uh, that's what it is. It's, it's just it's somebody with, that uses their mouth to go about to cause problems by sowing seeds of discord. And what these men here, these disciples of John the Baptist are doing is they're sowing discord. Whether they are even aware of it or not, they're they're trying to. They are attempting to sow discord. I want you to notice, first of all, in this truth, we find a, 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 a 
the baptism a, a hint, if you will, in baptism. We see baptism's hint here. And this is just kind of a little side note here that I don't want to run too far. But the Bible specifically says that uh, they were baptized in there uh, at that place in verse 23 because uh, there was much water. Well, do you think that if, if somebody was getting baptized and all they did was just pour a little water in your hand and dump it on, do you think you'd need much? No, you wouldn't. The point here is they needed much water because of what baptism is. You're going to need a whole lot more uh, than this to baptize somebody this size. Why? Because baptism is by immersion. Amen? And I'm not going to stay here long, but if you write in your Bible, mark that, make note of that, because if somebody comes at you won't act like, oh, baptism, you can do this, you can do that, the Lord gave us a hint. And the hint is you need a whole bunch of water because you're going to try to shove somebody's whole person down under the water. That's right. Why? Why do they do that? Because what does baptism represent? If you study baptism, it represents the death, burial, and resurrection. It represents the gospel. And splashing somebody with a handful of water don't look or sound nothing like the gospel. But seeing, seeing a dead soul be immersed into the water, a type and picture of the death and burial of the grave, and come out a new creature, that is the purpose of baptism. Amen. So we see baptism's hint under this dis- discordant uh, communication. But then we also see some babbling heads, talking heads, babbling, running that yapper. Amen. And that can be so dangerous. Amen. That can be so dangerous. And that's what they're doing. Notice what it says. I want you to look at the scriptures. Look at verse uh, 25. Then there arose question between some of John's disciples and the Jews. Notice about purification. When you study this verse and you study the word purification there and, and you try to figure out what they're talking about, there's no specific, there's no, uh, there's no unified understanding. Some think it could be talking about, you know, back in chapter 2, how that uh, those pots were for the purification of the people at that wedding ceremony. Y'all remember what I'm talking about, where the Lord said fill them up with water and He turned them into wine, non-alcoholic. All right, but, but purify, they, they used those pots to wash themselves for the purification of the people. Y'all know how that the Jews are big on washing themselves, washing their hands and things of that nature. <laughs> And some think that it's, it's got something to do with, you know, the, the law and the use of water and the cleansing and things of that nature. Ultimately, ultimately, I believe what's going on here revolves around the topic of the stretch of Scripture, which is what? Baptism. Ultimately, what I believe is going on here is I believe John's disciples is dealing with some Jews in regards to baptism as a form of purification. Essentially, they're entertaining ideas that revolve around Jewish ideology. And they're comparing Jewish ideology with John's gospel. And John's gospel was repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And that gospel was for the Jews only prior to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Are y'all with me tonight? And so what they're doing is they're, in my opinion, I believe what's going on is we've got some people that are taking the message of John and they're already trying to fit it into the message of the Jews. We've got compromise. We've got shakiness in the, the, the understanding of God's people in regards to what they believe and where they stand. So they're having these discussions with men that likely don't believe, it specifically says that they were discussing this with Jews. And so I believe we've got these babbling heads having inappropriate conversations that they shouldn't even be having. And they're not leaning on the preached word of God, they're leaning on what their heritage wants them to think and believe. And what's vitally important is that they... Uh, they get away from trusting in what they want and what they've been taught and how that they think 
And they begin to lean on what the Lord has brought into their life through the message and preaching of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist has already dealt with these things. He's already made it clear to them what baptism is, why they are to do it, what it represents, how that they would experience a water baptism there that day, but that one's coming after him who would baptize them with the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. And that that would change them and make them new. And he talks about in Matthew how that there is a baptism of fire. And that's not talking about the cloven tongues of fire that's coming down, friend. The baptism of fire is talking about being cast into hell and the lake of fire one day. Amen. You don't want the baptism of fire. How do I miss the baptism of fire? Experiencing the baptism of the Holy Ghost that you're experiencing salvation. Amen. Amen. And so, and so we've got inappropriate conversations taking place. And then we see a beheld uh, heightening, a lifting up, an elevation. Notice what they say there in verse 26. It says, They came unto John, said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come unto him. Behold, they said. We see a, a, a beheld heightening, heightening, a lifting up, an elevation. You know, I want to bring out an important truth. There has been some very prosperous men of the ministry. I could name some that, that had a huge platform. You know... The list goes on and on. You got you got men like you know Mays Jackson, Harold Seitler, Sammy Allen. Um, uh, I think about others that I don't care to mention, but had a big platform. You know, you think about Charles Spurgeon and, and D. L. Moody and and uh, and these you know these men had huge huge ministries and and had a big umbrella of outreach. And sometimes in those instances, what you'd find is you'd find the followers of those, those men, or not necessarily the followers, but the, the men that were closely influenced by them, a lot of times were crazy. <laughs> you know, it's almost like I heard one man say this. They said something about, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the men that want to follow the guys, the, the ministries that God blesses so much, a lot of times are... Uh, they have uh, in heightened qualities that are not desirable that come from that crowd. I don't know that that's true necessarily, but this is what I'll say. It's, it's sad sometimes how that a God of heaven will elevate a man's ministry and the people that they have a close influence of will live their life to try to bolster it up even higher. And it's almost like you know, there are literally there are literally men that call themselves a title based off of the man by which they followed. You know, there's a there's a group out there that likes to call themselves a Ruckmanite. And I ain't got no use for that title. And if I I'd li I don't know the guy that they get that title from. I never knew him, but I'd like to think that, you know, if he if he if he was the man he ought to be, he would he would have shut that junk down and said, Don't don't say that junk. Why? Because he must increase, but I must decrease. Right? Like, but can I say this? Could you imagine being in that position and wanting to kind of think, well, I like this. I think that was the problem with the Pharisees. I think the problem with the Pharisees was, was they didn't respond like John did. What the Pharisees should have done is when the Lord Jesus you know, came to the scene and he started doing what he was doing, the Pharisees should have said, y'all need to go listen to him. Quit listening to us. We want to hear what he's got to say too. But instead, they tried to discourage it and they were successful in doing so. Whereas John the Baptist here had the same controversial temptation, which is, you know, rabbi. Well, that's a that's a an appealing title. Would you agree, Master Teacher? All right, be like somebody coming up to me and saying, Doctor Shirley. <laughs> it's like, hold on. First of all, not me. Uh, I ain't no doctor. 
uh, but I appreciate the sentiment. You know what I'm saying? That's, that would be uh, our vernacular. That would be our equivalent. They're saying rabbi. And this is where it got inappropriate. Notice what they said. I want to look at it specifically. It says, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan. They didn't even say his name. He that was with thee beyond Jordan. You know, when I was young, I referred to my mama as she to my dad one time, and I experienced this real serious pain right here in this area. And it was like a flash before my eyes for it happened, and I was suffering. And he said, you never refer to your mother as she to me. Why? Because she was more important than that. And that is mama to you, boy. Amen. They're looking at John the Baptist. They're calling him rabbi, and they're referring to the Messiah, God's only begotten son as he. Here's the problem. They were close to John. They enjoyed the benefits of being close to John as his disciples. They loved John. They wanted to see John is successful. All these things are fine. The problem is that it is, it's, it's reached a level that's inappropriate because he's just a man. He's a very important man. He's fulfilled a very important role for God. But he's not God. He's just a man. And so we see this beheld heightening in verse 26. And this kind of helps us to understand the reasoning behind the discordant communication. The reason they're sowing this discord, the reason they're trying to cause this, uh, this controversial temptation to John is because they hold John in such a high regard. They hold John in an elevated position that simply put, has reached a level that's just not appropriate because John is not God. He's not God. Then we see the described circumstances by John. John helps them understand where they are. John summarizes the whole situation to them. Notice what he says. First we see a reminder of placement. John reminds them of his place. And John wants them to know he is aware of his place and he's not going to dare try to elevate him above the place that God's put him and placed him. Look what he says, verse 27. A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. John said, you know what he said? I'm just a man. Amen. I'm just a man. And whatever I have, it has been given to me from heaven. Notice verse 28. Ye yourselves bear witness me. In other words, he's saying, you've heard me say it. You know that I'm just telling you what I've done told you. I said, I am not the Christ, but, I, but that I am sent before him. John said, I'm not able to save you. I'm not the one that came from heaven. I'm not the Messiah. I've just come before the Messiah. I came before, I'm his forerunner, verse 29. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Y'all been to weddings? We love weddings, kind of, sort of. They're a blessing, amen. Uh, they're, they're fun. I mean, I enjoy weddings, Amen. And, uh, and, and, you know, you go to a wedding. Anybody go to a wedding to see who the best man is? No. Let me tell you something. Best man's important. Best man, best man has a role to play in that wedding, in that, in that ceremony, in the whole shebang. He's, he's got value to the wedding ceremony. But that wedding ceremony ain't about him. And whether or not he's there, most people won't know the difference. The bride ain't his. And if she is, we got problems. <laughs> Amen. Right. And when he starts thinking that he's got control of the bride, we got problems. Did you hear what I said? Right. Somebody could walk in there and say, you know, you look better than the groom does. You know, people here probably appreciate more, you more than they do the groom. Well, guess what he best do? He best remind them and real, make them realize I'm just a friend. I'm not the groom. Help me. Are you seeing the application? 
There's many a man throughout history that have treated the bride like he's the groom. And they need to follow his command. And they need to follow his control. And he has put himself on the pedestal as being the groom in their life. Being the God in their life. It's out of control and it's out of line. It's not appropriate. It is not appropriate. And he is not the groom. He ain't even... He ain't even this, this, this statement here has a big connotation to it. You know, there, when you look at the marriage supper of Lamb, the friend of the bridegroom is in that description, and it's talking about John the Baptist. I believe that's him. And I believe that he'll be there and have a role to play in the marriage supper. You understand? Nevertheless, nevertheless, here he wants us to realize he can't save. He's just been blessed to be given the title and the opportunity that he has. And they ain't not one of us, John the Baptist. <laughs> You're not John the Baptist, I ain't John. We're just, we're just people. And John the Baptist was, was the forerunner of Christ and he played an important role. And his role was magnificent and God gave it to him, but he's not the groom. And he made that abundantly clear, a reminder of his place. Then we see a reinforcement of his purpose. Verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. John hit the scene pretty high. John was given an opportunity to be elevated by God. And it was magnificent. And it was wonderful. And it was a blessing. But his purpose was to continue the increasing of Jesus Christ. And with that brought the decreasing of John the Baptist. And John wanted them to realize if they thought that following him was going to ride them off into the sunset and bring all this prosperity and promise and pomp and that they were mistaken because his role in the life of ministry of Jesus Christ was to go through a decreasing process. As a matter of fact, church, guess what? You don't hear from John after this here in the book of John because he goes to prison and he has his head cut off. This is it. This is the last things he says in, in John the, the Revelator, John the Beloved's book by inspiration of God. He goes through that decreasing process. This is a reinforcement of his purpose. These are the circumstances that John is describing. He shows them. He reminds them of his place in this thing. He reinforces his purpose. And then we see the responsibility proclaimed. Notice verse 32 and 33. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth. And no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set it to seal, or to his seal, that God is true. Notice verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the, but the wrath of God abideth in him. He, he, he shows them the responsibility of man being proclaimed. And then we see him raising the proper person in verse 34 and 35. He says, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. That's a real good verse. Like, he's given us the Holy Spirit. But now Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like John wants him to realize that the Spirit of God's been on him, the Spirit of God's been given to him, but in some capacities there's a measure to how much of the Holy Spirit we get. You say, how much? I, I don't know. I'm not really going to get into that because we get enough to get us into heaven eternally. Amen? But the Bible specifically says in regards to Jesus that there's no measure to the Holy Spirit in Him because they're completely one. John, wants, John is doing his dead level best to reveal to these people the big picture. And the big picture is every one of us, he's talking to some disciples, that want to follow and trust and believe and, and elevate and, 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 and bolster John. He's, now who's he talking to? He's talking to the disciples that are, that are invested in him. And you know what he's saying? Y'all better go with them. That's what John's saying. John, this, and see guys, this is such a vitally important detail. John is being blessed with an opportunity to have men that will just give their lives for him submit and sacrifice everything and be, be his go-getters. 
And he is looking at himself in such a proper perspective that he essentially tells them, I am not the guy he is. And every man has a responsibility to receive his testimony that, that, that it is true and that God is true. And then again, he raises that person even more. He reminds them about who he is. He has no measure of the Holy Spirit that's been given unto him because they're one. In verse 35, the Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. The fact of the matter remains that John here does the appropriate thing when a temptation came into his life that said, you can have as big a following as you want. And John says, I must decrease. And he must increase. Isn't it amazing where we are in, on Wednesday night tonight? Can I get a witness, Grace Baptist Church? It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing how supernatural this book is. I'm not accusing or looking at this church like, you know, y'all, y'all, y'all have tried to, you know, submit your lives to me and put me in a place where Jesus is. I'm not saying that. I'm not accusing that. I, I don't think that. But I just think it's amazing how that God has sent us this message to remind us what, who the main thing is. It's Jesus. It's Him. He has been given the Holy Spirit without measure. And we have been blessed with the Holy Spirit. Can I get a witness? Not only in our person, but in, in this place, in this, in this body. In this body. And, and it's a real presence of the Holy Spirit of God. There's no doubt. And if you think for a moment that that's because I'm here, you're succumbing to a controversial temptation that, it, that, can, that can hinder you. The Holy Spirit's not here because I'm here. The Holy Spirit is here because of a group of people that's committed to Him. Where two or three are gathered in His name. Every song that's sung, every testimony that's delivered, every action that takes place here in this body of believers must be about Him. Because when it's about them, us, then His presence ain't there because it says where two or three are gathered in His name. That means for His will, for His purpose, for His presence, for His, His, His gospel, His, His glory, His grace. Are you listening to tonight? It's about, it's about Him, period. And the Lord was so gracious enough to let me come here and be a part of it. And it didn't happen because I was here. It's happened because He was here. You know, I've thought a lot about this whole situation and how in the world did this church ever let me come in the first place? And honest to God, I do believe it was because God brought together a bunch of people that was desperate for Him. Sick of Sick of it not being about him anymore. Sick of it being about this or that and this motivation and that motivation. That's where I was. That's where I was. I was so tired of the struggle of power that I wanted to just do whatever the Lord had in store for me even if it didn't make sense. And it didn't make sense to me. But it was abundantly evident that it was His will. And I believe that Grace Baptist Church was at the same, same exact place. A group of people came together. Now some jumped ship and looked for the betterment of the gospel. Amen? But boy, God brought us together for the purpose of growing us and learning us and showing us what it's all about. And you know what it's all about? It's all about Him. It's all about Him and His glory and His will. And that's what the desire of this whole thing is. And uh, this message here tonight was probably just as much for me as it was anybody because I sure don't want to sure ever think that I am the groom or that I've got anything to offer the bride. 
because a man only has whatever is given to him by heaven, the Bible said. Ain't that what it said? I sure am thankful for the scriptures tonight. Amen. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you for your precious word. Lord, I sure am thankful for the supernatural magnificence of your word and how that time and time and time again you've given us just 